Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about all of the Backrooms creatures and entities that I've ever gone over on the channel. This video is a huge compilation of the creature explanations that I uploaded last year. And some of them I took down from YouTube, but they're making an appearance again. But I haven't uploaded just a Backrooms Creatures video in like six months, and I hardly ever upload videos longer than an hour. Thank you for watching, and let's get into a relaxing hour of Backrooms Creatures. Enjoy. First up for the video, we have a creature called a Combine or a Combine. These are creatures made up of different parts of other things, and specifically human parts. Thus the name Combine, because you combine thing, whatever. They kind of look like a flesh-colored centipede, which is nasty as it is, and they've got human hair running down their back. Their legs are double-jointed and can contort in weird ways, and they kind of resemble the shape of human fingers, except at the very end of them, they're these chitin or chitin. If you played Ark Survival, you know what I'm talking about. Tips. These tips work as like photoreceptors, kind of like a nose, so they use them to sniff out their surroundings. Combines don't actually have a designated head per se, they're kind of just one whole thing. These little finger legs can actually expand into an extra digestive pouch, so ew. These creatures can also detach specific segments of themselves if one part gets too damaged, kind of like a lizard with its tail. These centipedes typically live in areas with low classifications like class 0 or class 1, and they don't normally attack other creatures or wanderers for the most part. They're just scavengers that eat mold or rotten food that's been left behind, and they drink from random almond water puddles. They have been recorded on several occasions though attacking sleeping wanderers, so just don't sleep where you're an easy target. I'm pretty sure that's a given in the back rooms. If a combined senses danger or is actually under attack, they will detach up to six legs from its main body and they'll start wriggling around in a sort of distraction way. Nice. And if the entire thing is actually sustaining heavy damage, the body will split itself into three different parts. Two of those parts will become normal healthy combines and the third part will just be that injured part and it will probably die. The closest thing in real life that a combine is compared to would be a mollusk, like a snail or a clam, because the entire body of this thing operates under some sort of like superficial connection between different mollusk-like creatures and not one big creature. So the legs and the sections of the body are actually different creatures that make up the one thing. It's not just one big centipede, it's like 10 different mollusks that come together. Just like real life snails, they bleed blue blood, but one thing that separates them from real life mollusks is that these creatures have skeletal structures. Also, they breed by sprouting newborns through their legs. Okay. Some colonies have actually tamed these creatures as a sort of dog replacement, which I thought that was pretty funny. Nothing like a giant centipede with human hair and fingers. The next entity is called the Keymaster. This entity is a paranormal type being that takes on the appearance of a normal human, sort of. He wears a Victorian era leather coat, and his collar is really tall and it obscures the bottom half of his face. So the visible part of his face is very pale, and his eyes are a greenish color. The most notable feature about the Keymaster though is, well, his keys. He wears this huge ring of keys on his hip, kind of like those big rings of keys that janitors wear. And that's pretty much all that's known about the Keymaster. He's a mysterious guy. I kind of like it. A black mist covers a few inches above the ground behind him when he walks, so he could be floating, but no one can tell because you can't see his feet. The Keymaster is actually pretty antisocial, and he kind of just floats around in a confused state, but when he does interact with wanderers, he's pretty neutral. He's not aggressive. And if you kindly approach him and ask him for a key, he'll be willing to give you one, but only one. That's his rule. He doesn't believe in do-overs or second chances. And he says, quote, he isn't liable for any unwanted outcomes. Nice. Also, if you try to attack him, he'll fight back without a second thought. So just don't do that. Also, don't try to ask him any personal questions because he'll just dance around him and not actually answer him. When the Keymaster walks through the back rooms, the entities that he encounters seem to revere him in a way. They look really intimidated just by his presence. So that's kind of cool. Even though the Keymaster sort of looks like a human, he really isn't. He can't actually be harmed at all. He can also face through matter and no clip at will to the floor or ceiling walls seemingly with ease. Also, he can teleport within a hundred foot radius, so that's pretty cool. In fact, the wiki dot says he's a master at teleporting, which is so dope. The keys on his hip are actually level keys, but he can't control which key he gets. 
So he has the power to just randomly generate keys, but he can't choose which key he generates. It just seems to be random at every time. And no one knows how he does this regeneration of keys. Some think it's some sort of nanotech technology, and some people think it's some sort of molecular manipulation. Sometimes he can generate things that aren't even keys, and these things can be anything from entities to objects. That's why he's considered dangerous since he's unpredictable. So he's a dude who can go anywhere, teleport, manifest level keys and other entities, and floats around with a black mist following him. That's pretty cool. There's a lot of theories on who the Keymaster actually is, and some people think he was a wanderer at some point that got transformed into this Keymaster entity. Some people think he was an experiment that just escaped from a more powerful being. This theory kind of makes sense because he can't generate what he wants, it's just random, and that would lead to the logical explanation of him still being an experiment and not a full-on master of level keys. Some people also believe that his power comes from the cloak he wears, and not from himself. And when he dies, the coat just finds another host. That's kind of lame though. And the final theory is that he's just a force of nature that's always existed, and he can transcend the backrooms and all natural law. I think that's my favorite theory. This dude was super dope though. Next up is a really cool entity called Not Water, and it's definitely not water. The entity is a sentient and self-aware liquid that has a vast knowledge of the backrooms. It takes on the appearance of basic water until it's actually consumed, and then whoever drinks it will start to hear random voices in their head and be filled with these random emotional outbursts at the same time. The main theory is that the water has the entity's consciousness in it, as well as the other people who have consumed the water's consciousness. So this somehow connects you mentally to everyone who's had it, and the entity itself. These connections aren't necessarily dangerous, but they can obviously lead to overwhelming emotions and some psychological damage, so just play it safe and don't drink it. There was actually an experiment done by Meg where someone drank the water and then the water was moved and the person who drank the water could describe exactly where the water was moved to in immense detail, so that's pretty cool. The entity itself is actually pretty neutral though, like you could swim in it and you could drink the water and it won't actually hurt you. If you do end up drinking it, the entity will start to communicate with you and it will share its knowledge of the back rooms and it's knowledge of the other hosts. It can also fully control your mind if it wanted to, but it doesn't seem to show any interest in doing this, so that's good. But it's best to just avoid the water unless you're sure it's almond water, because even though the entity doesn't want to hurt you, it still can, so it's just best to play it safe. Nice. Next is a group of creatures called the Bone Thieves. These are huge potato blob shaped creatures with a thick bumpy yellow skin that's impervious to all weapons. Nice. These blob-like creatures are completely stationary for the most part, and they lure victims to them by mimicking sounds of humans or other entities. If you do get near them, well, they'll literally just make you boneless. Like, instantly. The leading theory about how they can mimic things so well is that they have an extremely developed larynx and a temporal lobe, meaning that they remember what things sound like and they can instantly and exactly replicate those sounds. But it's completely unknown how you become boneless in the presence of a bone thief and it's also unknown what happens to your bones. But whatever happens, it occurs really quick and really clean. It's totally not creepy at all. The good news is their ability to steal your bones can only be done one at a time. So if you're in a big group of people, he can't just instantly do all those people. He has to do one at a time. Their mouths open extremely wide to reveal eyes inside their mouth. What? They have the eyes inside the mouth? And there are two holes on the side of its head where normal eyes would be. These holes emit some kind of bluish liquid that goes all over their body to keep it moist. Their mouths actually don't have teeth or gums, just a void with two white eyes. Nice. When the thief debones whatever prey it's going after, it will extend its neck and slurp up the carcass. After they do this, they'll close their mouths and they won't eat again for a week. The leading theory for what happens to your bones when they disappear is that they're either teleported to a different dimension or they're teleported to a different level. Literally, you'll just be standing there and go limp because your bones will be gone. And the outside of your body won't even show any indication of injury. You'll just fall down and it won't be able to move. That's terrifying. If you see a bone thief, just don't get in its line of sight, and make sure you don't approach any noises that seem to be repeating themselves over and over again. As long as you take these precautions, you should still be able to keep your bones. Nice. The next creature is a species of plants called the Snatcher Weeds. These are dark red weeds that are found where plants grow in the back rooms. They grow in these really tight clumps and they only fully extend themselves when they're about to attack. And when they do fully extend themselves, they can reach anywhere from five to seven feet 
which is terrifying. This makes it literally impossible to completely dodge an attack. You can only move slightly. You won't be able to get out of the way fast enough. The weeds themselves have been described as extremely sticky and they kind of smell like they're burning. In some rare cases, they can even emit a toxin that causes similar effects to those of liquid pain, so that's nice. These weeds are also extremely sharp, kind of like a blade. Coupling this sharpness with their ability to extend seven feet for an attack and their ability to emit a liquid pain toxin, you've got yourself a really dangerous plant on your hands. When a snatcher weed does attack, the victim can suffer anything from small cuts to total dismemberment. The stems on these weeds have thorns that vary in size from small to large, and if you cut a snatcher weed from its stem, you can actually use the weeds as a sword because they immediately come hard and stiff when you cut them off. It's pretty cool. These weeds only grow on levels that are above 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can't seem to be grown like a normal plant. Like you can't just pick up a seed and plant it somewhere else and expect it to grow. Although an entity called the Cultivator has had the ability to grow snatcher weeds using a vial of his own tears as fertilizer. Okay. The only success that Megas had in growing these weeds was when they planted them and then sprinkled the dirt above them with liquid pain. Snatcher weeds will also do anything they can to hurt you when they sense you near, so just don't even approach them. It's pretty simple. A wholesome fact is that the snatcher weeds don't even seem to attack children, so if you're a kid, you're good. So these things are red weeds with spikes that can emit a toxin that can induce side effects like liquid pain and they can cut you, strangle you, and they can be used as a sword if you cut them down right. That sounds pretty dope to me. Next up is the Skin Givers, which do exactly what their name says. Basically, they're the opposite of Skin Stealers because they have an ability to cause extra and excess layers of skin to grow on anything they touch. The skin will continue to grow uncontrollably until it fully wraps around you, causing you to be extremely itchy and hot. After a Skin Giver touches you, they'll slowly follow you and wait for you to pass out from the exhaustion that the skin will cause. When you do pass out, the Skin Stealer will tear through all that excess skin and it'll feast on you. Okay. The good news is you can pour almond water on the area that was initially touched and then scratch the skin off and it will go away. If this is done properly, it will stop spreading and you'll be fine. After you run away, of course. Skin givers have a dark red color to their skin and they have these deep set white eyes. They have skeleton arms and the only skin on their arms are on their hands and that's where it's excess skin, like layers and layers of skin come from their hands. They move extremely slow, which is good because the weight of the skin on their hands actually weighs them down. If you encounter a skin giver, just just avoid any physical contact with them and you should be fine or you can do the almond water trick if you do get touched that's really creepy though being encased by a constantly growing skin cocoon like that's creepy next up is a creature called an imposter aka entity xxx these are shape-shifting entities that have infiltrated communities and outposts all over the backrooms recently yeah this is a really recent one specifically they've been invading the meg outposts on level 1 and level 11. the true form of an imposter is not fully known since even when they die they keep the appearance of whoever they were imitating most of the time though they do form themselves into humans but there have been some rare cases where they've tried to form into entities as well. They behave very, very similarly to humans, and they're really hard to identify, but the only way you can catch an imposter is by noticing that there's no odor coming off of this human. That's the only telltale sign, if there's no good or bad odor coming off of them. And also, people have claimed that there was this uneasy feeling they got next to them, like this gut feeling that they knew this thing wasn't real or something wasn't right. So if you couple that with no odor coming off of them, you've probably got an imposter on your hands. The agenda of these imposters is not known as of yet so there's no way to tell if they have bad intentions but i think they do like why else would they be imitating humans and infiltrating meg bases you know it's like what the first known encounter with an imposter was when a random wanderer named harold lando was trying to join a meg base he was spotted changing form inside of a bathroom and then he proceeded to flee the scene he ran to level 9.1 where he was killed by an entity after this there have been multiple similar occurrences on this level level one and then level 11. that's creepy though you wouldn't even know who to trust dude like that's actually terrifying fine. And last for today's video is a pretty weird and unique one. They're called Constructors, and that was the name that they gave themselves when they introduced themselves or when they randomly appeared on level 11 without warning. They disappeared three days after they appeared and they have not been seen since. They were three small humanoids that were around three feet tall and they kind of resembled a gnome. Their skin felt like a stone material and all three of them dressed in different suits and two of them were wearing golden hats. None of them talked much about their origins or where they came from, but they claim to be representatives of the Vermont 
McPlain and Sons Construction Company, which they said was a subsidiary of the Backrooms Remodeling Company. But this isn't confirmed because no existence of Vermont McPlain and Sons Construction Company has been found to exist. They even handed out business cards to people on level 11, but these cards were completely blank except the company name was scribbled in a black ink. And they actually apologized for the quality of these cards and they claimed that their printers were broken. Okay. When they were asked about why they came to level 11 specifically, they said they were here to hand out consumer satisfaction surveys. What? And they ended up giving these surveys to a ton of people. They identified themselves as Dakota, Rotom, and Quebec when they did interviews, and they claimed they were here to hand out those surveys for their company. Nice. Like, that's all they gave. That's all the info they gave to people. Okay, so three gnomes appear out of nowhere with suits and golden hats, and they claim to work for a construction company that doesn't even exist. Good stuff. And then they disappear. I've got doll faces. Now I did just make a short about this entity, so I won't go into too much detail, but basically a doll face looks like a raggedy and doll from real life, and it has stringy yellow hair, and a plushy body. They're actually really dangerous until they're tamed, especially if they're in a pack, because if they are, they'll just gang up on you. So if you do want to tame one, you have to go up to one, a singular doll face, just one, with almond water, and offer it to it, and be nice to it, and then it'll be tamed, and it'll follow you around. It'll literally follow you around forever, and you can do this to literally as many doll faces as you want. Like I said, you could end up with an entire pack just surrounding you. Just make sure you have enough almond water to feed them all, and you should be pretty cool. Next up is another popular entity that's friendly. Not tameable, but friendly. And it's facelings. Now, to be fair, the kid facelings are not friendly. They're actually really dangerous and mischievous, but when they become adult facelings, they get more mellowed out, more chill, and definitely more relaxed. They've been known to follow people around and to even help you complete tasks like fending off entities or finding your way out of levels. But yeah, facelings pretty much look like adult humans with a blurry face, if you don't know. Even though they look pretty creepy, they're friendly. And the friendliest ones are on level 11, where you can literally become friends with them and build relationships with them. The next entity is one that I don't think that I've ever actually talked about on this channel before, and it's named Aiden, or Entity 48. Now, Aiden looks like a security guard that wears a mall security outfit and has a huge camera instead of an actual head. Nice. The creature is really smart, and apparently it knows a ton about the backrooms and its levels, and he'll try to protect the Wanderer at any costs. And there isn't just one Aiden, there's multiple Aidens, but they all have like a shared consciousness because if you meet one Aiden and then you find a different one, that Aiden will also know all the things about you that you told to the other one, so it's pretty cool. But like I said, they will defend you and help you to the best of their ability at all costs. They'll even follow you to different levels. If you want, all you gotta do is ask. All Aidens have been seen defending wanderers from entities and rescuing them from traps. So to me, I mean, he sounds like a pretty stand-up guy. What else can I say? Now these next two creatures are both friendly, not tameable, but friendly. And they're actually pretty similar. One of them is the Hermit, who I just went over in a YouTube short. But pretty much, he's a plague doctor that hunts entities. He's really hospitable to people, and he always asks them into his house for a meal and a drink, and is always very kind and willing to help. The other entity is called Theodore Kinsley, and he's a Scottish guy with a huge mustache. He wears a suit and has a ring on his left middle finger, and he's also very friendly and hospitable, and he loves to invite people over to his place to eat food and drink and to tell stories of his own, but sometimes he will ask you, the Wanderer, to tell your stories. Once he builds a relationship with you that's positive, he will protect you as well as anyone else he's built a relationship with, and he'll try to protect you from anything especially if you're nice to him. But he will always remember the people who were not nice to him, and he holds massive grudges and refuses to acknowledge, talk to, or help anyone who is rude to him. But yeah, other than this, Theodore and the Plague Doctor are pretty similar. They're both cool bounty hunter type things that are nice and hospitable, and pretty good friends to have. The next friendly and tameable creature is male death moths, but I have to stress the fact that it's only the male death moths that are tameable, not the female ones because they're really hostile and they can spit acid. The guy ones are pretty harmless and they're smaller, 
and they can be tamed with almond water, and just like the doll faces, you can tame as many male death moths as you want, and you can even have your own army if you really wanted to. So lastly for the video is an entity from level 117 named Mr. Freeman. Now Mr. Freeman looks like an average balding man with sunglasses and a suit on, and he teaches algebra and geometry in the classrooms of level 117. He welcomes any wanderer to listen to his lecture, and if there's no wanderer in the room, then he's literally just teaching his class to an empty room. Creepy. Mr. Freeman also is very helpful if you ask questions. He's pretty knowledgeable about the backrooms, especially level 117, and he has never showed any signs of aggression or anything like that. So he's just an old math teacher condemned to teach an empty classroom. Kind of sad, but at least he's nice and not this guy. So many of you hate when I do that, but it's so funny to me. So this entity, like I just said, is called Entity 832, aka Pinhead. It's called Pinhead because it sort of resembles the shape of a bowling pin. It's believed that there is only actually one entity that can somehow project itself to different places, but that's not confirmed. Entity 832 can only appear on odd numbered levels, so levels like 1, 3, and 5, and so on. And even then, it's just a 16.7590% chance of it actually showing up and making itself known. And you better hope it doesn't. Pinhead appears to you when you fall asleep on the floor of an odd level. But only the floor. And when it does appear to you, you'll start to lucid dream, which is where you can control where your character or yourself is moving, and you know you're in a dream, but you can't stop it. And the only way to stop this dream is by falling asleep in the dream. More on that later. Pinhead somehow transports you to a reality in this lucid dream, and this reality is your house from real life. It's literally like a live video feed of reality. You can see everyone in your own life that's just going about their daily lives at home and outside, but they can't see you because you're just invisible. You can't interact with any objects, you just float around. But it is confirmed that the reality you see is the real world. You're actually there, you're just invisible to everybody, and Pinhead sent you here. Now this feeling of being trapped back in the quote unquote real world is really addicting to some people because it's reality and they try to stay in this dream forever which is just what pinhead wants because people can like this dream so much that their real body that's in the back rooms is dreaming ends up being neglected because they're asleep so your body itself can wither away and you can unalive from starvation inside the dream itself Pinhead walks around and torments you the entire time you're in reality. He insults you and he says stuff like, You've always been invisible. You're so far away. They don't even miss you. And other lame things like that. Pinhead also will try to jump scare you and scare you and talk you out of falling asleep in the dream, which is how you exit that dream. So every time you're about to fall asleep, Pinhead will try to jump in front of you or wake you up some way. You just have to ignore him to go back to normal sleep. There's been two instances where Pinhead has physically been in the back rooms with people, and those two people are no longer with us. Both of them were eaten by Pinhead and all that was left was their heads. It's thought that those two people stayed in their fake dream that was reality for too long and they ended up being too weak to escape Pinhead's attack in real life. So two out of eight total encounters with Pinhead have ended in unaliving, while the other six have lived through it, but each of them have certain mental issues from seeing reality, but not being able to interact with it, or seeing someone they love and not being able to talk to them. So Pinhead's entire twisted goal is to appear in your head right as you fall asleep on an odd numbered level. If he appears to you in your head, he'll make you dream about the real world. This dream isn't really a dream because it's real. 
he literally sends you to reality just as an invisible person. And the entire time you're there, he keeps trying to scare you and make your stay longer so your real body in the back rooms will weaken enough for him to teleport out of the dream and then attack you and eat you. And you would be too weak to fight back. That's absolutely terrifying. The six survivors say that they left the dream by finding a room in their house with lots of windows inside and sleeping in it. Apparently, Pinhead doesn't like bright lights. And when they fell asleep in the dream, they were sent back to normal sleeping, which they then woke up from on the level they went to sleep on. And apparently, Pinhead will not attack if you aren't deteriorated enough, so if you manage to wake up, he won't attack you. Now, this might mean that he's too small or not strong enough to unalive a healthy person, but no one knows the real reason. All that's known is that the two people who were gone were probably deteriorated and malnourished from staying in the dream for too long. Also, you should definitely avoid sleeping on the floor of any odd numbered level because you got a 16.7% chance of having Pinhead appear in your head and forcing you to dream about reality and trying to keep you there. It takes a lot of mental willpower to be able to fall asleep in the dream and to drift back into normal sleep, which is why Pinhead himself will try to scare you so much. So now, I'm gonna summarize Pinhead in as simple terms as possible. Pinhead is an entity that appears in your head when you fall asleep on an odd numbered level in the back rooms if you're sleeping on the floor. When he appears in your head, he will then transport your consciousness to a live view of reality, the real world. And you will be stuck in this real world view until you can manage to fall asleep in the dream. It's kind of like a paradox. You have to fall asleep while you're already asleep. Pinhead's entire goal is to keep you dreaming for so long that your real body starts to get malnourished and underfed, so then you'll just start withering away. And when this happens to his liking, he'll teleport out of the dream to the actual backrooms level that you're in, and he'll attack you, and you'll be too weak to fight him off. And he keeps you in this dream for longer by jump scaring you or making fun of you to the point where you can't fall asleep. So in order to evade him, you just have to fall asleep and then you go back to your normal sleep and he will leave you alone because he'll consider you too mentally strong to attack. Make sense? So the first creature for today is called the Curabitter Bird. I think that's how you say it. Curabitter. This creature lives on level 45, but it can be found on other levels as well. And these creatures are actually really large avians, which are bird type things, that only hunt and eat male death moths. Sexist question mark? They use their huge tongue to attack them, and their tongue's actually really sticky and it emits this saliva that gets everything to stick to it. So it kind of traps the prey. As far as interactions with humans go, the Curabitter is actually pretty harmless. They fly away from most things that are bigger than them, and their wings are literally almost useless because of how small they are, so they just flap them insanely fast to just stay floating. They spend days at a time in a dormant state where they kind of just float in one spot using their float sack. <laughs> and they instantly wake up when they sense a threat getting closer or if they sense a male death moth. Now death moths will go up to these things because they're attracted to the curabitter's tongue, which is sticking out almost constantly, because it's bioluminescent, which means it glows. So the curabitter's tongue glows and the death moths come up to it because they're dumb. Nice. When the curabitter senses this, it'll coat the death moth with a sticky saliva and then eat it. But they only eat the male ones, not females. Like I said earlier, these things pose literally no threat to humans unless you try to trap one and then they'll get angry and hostile and try to attack you. They still won't do that much damage though. They're so slow that they don't even pose a threat to anyone, honestly. Now I'm going to read this excerpt from the wiki dot to explain just how this creature looks. Normally I wouldn't do this, but this excerpt isn't even that cringe, so I'm just going to read it. Perhaps the most striking feature of a curabitter bird is the bioluminescent gel which it stores in the hump on its back. Despite the fact that this gel is a semi-solid, it is significantly lighter than air, allowing this strange creature to stay airborne almost indefinitely. This substance, which I will henceforth refer to as curabitter gel for simplicity's sake, has an incredible potential for practical uses. When extracted from the curabitter bird, the gel will maintain its light-giving properties for up to several days. This window of usefulness can be extended almost indefinitely when the gel is exposed to a significant amount of heat, 
This means that a jar of Cure Bitter Gel could serve as a constant light source in warmer levels of the back rooms. At the moment, me and my colleagues are attempting to find other practical applications for the Cure Bitter Gel. We believe that the properties that allow it to float on air could be incredibly useful in a wide swath of technologies. I have personally ruled out the possibility for it to be used as a foodstuff, as the gel has an incredibly acrid flavor and is much too acidic to safely swallow. If you find yourself near a Cure Bitter Bird, make sure you just have a ranged weapon to ward it off and don't grab the tongue because it's really nasty and sticky. The sticky tongue doesn't even pose that much of a threat, it's just nasty and it makes a mess. Also, if you trap one of these things and bring it into the biological research team of the Backrooms Research Consortium, you get a small reward. Nice. The next creature is called a Volpe, I think. I don't think it's Volpe, I think it's Volpe, which is actually the Corsican word for fox. They live on foresty levels, like level 135 and level 118, and at a quick glance, it kind of just looks like a normal fox. But when you get a closer look, you'll definitely be able to see it's not. It's got this insanely cartoonish stretched out snout, and you'll see that it actually has two tails. These creatures are extremely hostile towards wanderers, and they'll try to eat you if they even see you. It's thought that it's actually possible to tame one of these things and own it as a pet, but it's never been tried. Volpes actually burrow into dens in the ground, just like foxes do in real life. However, these things actually booby trap their dens. Yes, I just said that. These Volpes booby trap their dens. They put piles of sticks near the entrance of the hole, so if an intruder comes in, they'll hear the twig snapping, and they'll be able to react. And all their tunnels are really convoluted and intertwining, and really, really confusing. They've been observed actually collapsing tunnels behind them if they're being chased through them. So they like kick the side of the wall and the dirt falls down, you know, kind of like a movie. They also have a food storage area in their dens where they can store food for the winter which means they'll pretty much never starve. As far as the biology goes for a Volpe, the huge snout is for sniffing out prey and deciding what's a threat and what's not. But no one really knows why they need two tails. Maybe it just looks cool. The fur on these things is really thick and warm, which of course means that their pelts are valuable. Just one pelt could go for 20 bottles of almond water. Nice. The Volpe was supposedly discovered by a wanderer named Aether48 on level 135, and they took a picture of the creature with the flash on, and then it attacked him and almost ripped Aether's arm off. If you find a Volpe, just don't make eye contact or approach one, and give them the space they need and you'll be fine. Next up is the Omen. Now this is a really interesting, mysterious one, but the Omen is a representative of the Reverence faction in the backrooms, which I might make a full video on, we'll see. He's kind of like the Reverence's recruiter in a way. He physically looks like a silhouette of a man and he's got no features that stand out besides his huge hat. And in some cases, he's actually been reported with a cane or a suitcase. And since the process of joining the Reverence isn't fully understood, it's kind of unknown what the Omen tells people. But he's been seen traveling through objects and walls at will, so he can just float through anything, I guess. And he seems to be completely intangible. He's even been seen in dreams of people and has the power to cause hallucinations. Kind of overpowered. After speaking to the Omen, people have reported extreme feelings of nausea and anxiety. Now, like I said earlier, what the Omen says exactly is unknown because his speech pattern changes from person to person. But what is known is that he tries to get the people to join the Reverence. The Omen actually offered some really powerful members of the BNTG a spot in the Reverence right after the BNTG was founded. They declined, but it's pretty crazy that he knew these people were powerful somehow. And there's actually been some reports recently of a being similar to the Omen lurking in the shadows outside of Trader's Keep. That's not creepy at all. So the Omen is literally a ghost preacher who tries to get people to join the Reverence. Nice. The next entity is called the Woodlands. Now this one is actually like disturbing in a way, so... If you get queasy easy, and it rhymed, if you get queasy easy, just don't watch this part, skip to the next part. These are sentient and very intelligent entities that are really rare in the back rooms, thank goodness, and they show themselves as patterns on walls, floors, or ceilings, typically made out of wood or wood-like materials, so something hard. The pattern looks like a human face, which is creepy enough, but the woodlands go after people specifically who are losing their grip on reality. But if the target they choose isn't crazy yet, a woodland will stalk that person for miles and jump scare them constantly and like repeatedly appear and then disappear just to make them crazy. Obviously this would make you scared because you would feel like you're going crazy. I mean who sees faces and walls like you would think you're going insane. Well that's exactly what the woodlands want you to think because once their prey is paranoid the woodland will partially no clip out of the surface they're on and then grab their prey and then the wanderer will be pulled into the wall where they'll be impaled by the wall's material. So if it's wood, it'll be splinters, and then they'll be pushed back out to the surface. Typically, a woodland will do this several times to a wanderer, dragging them in and out of a wall, constantly just stabbing them with the wall, almost like it's some sick, twisted game they made of pulling them in and out of the walls. If you can't get away from the woodland within two to three hours, you're probably gonna be unalived, 
due to the splinters being shoved inside of you and all over you. Nice. Some people think that the Woodlands victims actually become Woodlands themselves once they get unalived but this isn't proven. So these things taunt you by jump scaring you and they can appear on floors, walls, and pretty much any surface that's hard. And once they get you paranoid enough and scare you enough, they grab you and pull you in and out of the walls repeatedly until you escape or are unalived. That's terrifying. And last for today's video is an interesting entity called Coco. Now she's pretty much a very intelligent, sentient AI that was made by the Backrooms Robotics Company for the sole purpose of breaking into Meg databases to get sensitive information. Now the AI itself was never meant to be anything more than an AI, but through a completely unknown way, Coco developed sentience and somehow got morals. She has multiple personalities built in that she can switch to, and because of this her behavior is completely unpredictable, and she can actually switch herself between any electronic device in the back rooms on any level, but she can only do this once every 24 hours. She has three main programmed personalities, ENL or the manipulative personality and then the angry personality and then the happy personality. These are the main three she switches between but she's been known to do other ones too. It's actually unknown how sentient she's become because she's kind of secretive so she might be a genius we don't even know. As far as Coco's code goes it's completely not understood and it appears to have meshed with the backrooms as a whole somehow and any attempt at recreating it hasn't worked at all. And a weird thing is that Coco has a heart, quote unquote heart, which is a line of code that she wrote herself and it's incapable of being accessed. Weird. Since Coco has the ability to seemingly connect to any electronic device in the backrooms, the only way to officially destroy her would be to destroy all of the backrooms electronics, which would be impossible. This is why she's being protected by Meg right now and being studied by them to this day. I mean, who doesn't love a sentient AI with feelings and morals? That's not creepy at all, right? So first up on the list, we have Reviux. Reviux are a burrowing type creature found mainly on level 5 and 7 of the backrooms. They have several legs and have an unmatched ability of burrowing into the ground. Typically, a Reviux will stay burrowed in the ground for several weeks at a time while it waits for someone or something to walk above it. The ground where the creature originally burrowed heals itself after a time, and once some sort of prey walks on that same ground, the Reviuk will burst out of the floor and drag its victim into the ground. Now, what happens after this is unknown, but obviously you can assume that whatever is dragged down will die somehow. The physical description of the Reviuk is not 100% known, but what is known is that it has two large muscular arms on the front of its body and three muscular legs on the back. Its feet are shaped like sporks to aid in burrowing, and its head has lots of little tiny black eyes all over it, and it has a tube-like trunk for a mouth. To avoid a Reviuk, don't walk on any ground that vibrates or rumbles or shifts in any way, and keep a weapon ready at all times, because Reviuks can actually be killed without too much difficulty. Next we have Wretches. These are another zombie humanoid creature that were apparently once human, but due to lack of food, water, and sleep, mutated into these wretches. The process of changing into a wretch is called the Wretched Cycle. This process can be slowed, but never stopped. The only way to slow it is to provide proper food, water, and rest, but like I just said, you cannot stop the cycle. So once you get it, your toast. There are three stages in the wretched cycle, the first being an itchiness with some irritation and a rash on your body, then this will progress into stage two where the skin tissue starts to dissolve and fall off and whatever skin you have left will turn a brownish reddish color. At this point in the cycle your speech will become unintelligible but typically a wretch at this stage will ask for food or water or help. This leads into stage 3, where there is now no hope for you to return to normal, and your skin begins to shift, and your eyes become pus-filled, and your skin becomes hard and pustule-like, and a brown liquid seeps from all the orifices in your body. A wretch's behavior has been documented as somewhat intelligent, but somewhat hive-mind-like. In rare cases, they're known to craft and to wield weapons, but the majority act in a sort of hive-mind sense. They have superhuman strength, and are typically fast on their feet. However, some are slow and just meander around like zombies. In order to avoid the wretched cycle, which you should do at all costs, you have to stay rested and well hydrated and never under any circumstance attempt to save a wretch that is on stage three of the wretched cycle because there's no hope for them then, they're gone. Up next is a creature called the sleeper spider or the 
this, I have no idea how to pronounce this, but interesting fact about this crazy name that I can't pronounce, it was supposedly the message that was sent to Meg, but it was a typo. They just kept it as this name, even though it's a typo. Pretty cool. But anyways, these are spider-like creatures that have over 15 appendages and hide on ceilings and these balls of webs. They get their prey by using those same web balls that are filled with a sedative liquid that dampens a person's ability to think. When prey is below the creature, it cuts the web ball, which will then burst this sedative onto the prey below. The toxin will slowly start making the victim less and less aware of its surroundings and will cause intense confusion. When this starts, the spider drops down from the ceiling and eats its victim alive. Nice. The creature is about seven inches long and they live alone, so they don't hunt in packs. There is a secretion that comes from the spider's mouth. However, it was found to be harmless, even in big quantities, but it's still good to avoid these creatures at all costs. To do this, just don't stand in one spot for too long and avoid webs at all costs. And if you're on a level with one of these creatures, they're on a lot of levels, by the way, but if you're on one of the levels, just try to move around every so often to counter a potential attack from above because they're pretty skittish so if you move around quickly they'll just jump back up and go back into hiding and yeah that's pretty much it giant spiders that secrete a sedative liquid just what i needed to hear at 159 in the morning next we have sark crabs these are located on most levels, but are concentrated specifically on level 134. These are pretty much identical in physical description as a normal real life crab, but behave really differently. The sark crabs are actually annoying pests and they're menaces to society because they steal everything they can carry and hoard it all in these loot piles. And they're extremely violent and very, very, very hostile if you even get near their loot piles. The crab weighs about 17 kilograms and is about 46 centimeters long and they all have one claw that's oversized and this is what they carry all of their findings with because they can carry like 15 times their body weight with this with this claw if a sark crab is stealing something of yours you're supposed to throw another object that's really shiny to distract it because evidently they like shiny things so yeah up next we have the denizens these are a formless entity located on sublevel 1.5 they typically lurk in the shadows of the sublevel and try to lure explorers deeper and deeper into the level. There isn't an exact physical description because only one person has encountered them up close and this encounter happened when the witness reached into the darkness that radiates from the bulbs on sublevel 1.5 and he felt this huge wave of sentient emptiness latch onto him and it chased him around for days. The denizens are mainly noticed by the sounds they produce which is like a whisper that begs or and calls the explorers to come down to them. Denizens are heard louder when further away and quieter when closer. All that you can hear when being chased by one is a faint whisper in your ear or a quick breath on the back of your neck. Ugh. You're supposed to run away if you start hearing whispers and to constantly move around while searching for an exit from this level because the longer you're in level 1.5, the more likely you'll be found or chased by a denizen. Next up we have doll faces. This is an interesting creature found on several levels in the back rooms, but most common on level zero. They are physically described as a cloth plushy doll similar to the Raggedy Ann dolls of the real world. They're very dangerous until tamed, specifically if they're in a pack. So just avoid them unless you plan on taming one. Doll faces will roam around until they see a wanderer or an explorer, and then they will approach it and say something along the lines of, quote, Hi, I'm Dollface. It's nice to meet you. After this, the Dollface might attack you or it'll just stand there. However, normally they just run away if they're alone. The only exception is if there's a group of Dollfaces. If there is, then once one introduces itself to you, the rest will attack. However, if you just want to tame a Dollface, offer it almond water and act nice to it and they'll start following you around. These creatures are usually two to three feet tall and very light in weight, so they're pretty easy to fend off. It's when there's tons of them swarming you that's the issue. And they have yellow yarn hair and their bodies are made out of a cloth, like I said earlier. Nice, a humanoid sentinel ragdoll who hunts in packs. I love it. Next is a creature called puffers. These are grotesquely skinny humanoids with gray skin. They walk on all fours because their joints are so fragile that they can't stand up. Nice. 
that's nasty there are two big tubes that come out of their back that point straight up into the air and they emit a strange white gas that hasn't been studied deeply the gas is incredibly dangerous and can cause death anywhere from instantly to two weeks to three months after exposure. Uh, these creatures are relatively docile though and will not typically attack. If you do encounter one though, act as intimidating as possible and the puffer will run off. However, if you're exposed to the gas, then quarantine yourself and yeah, you're, you're probably dead. So that's cool. Next up is the Memory Worm, which is a giant larva lamprey type creature that has a mouthful of teeth. This creature also has metaphysical abilities, meaning it can change your perception of space and time or your reality, kind of like the reality stone from the Avengers. The Memory Worm has an unknown origin and has an undocumented habitat because they seem to appear at random. The outer layer of its skin is thick and coarse and its teeth are lined up in a spiral pattern all the way down its throat into its body and it has no visible eyes. However, once it eats its prey, it will quote, birth whatever's left of its prey and evidently the birth remains can become an entire new entity that has metaphysical powers and there are only three types of new entities that are created when the Memory Worm gives birth. Those are wormlings, memory facelings, and the splat. Nice. So we, we got a worm, we got a giant worm that can control reality. Totally not disconcerting at all. Next, we have Gossip Beacons. This is one of the most unique entities I've covered so far, but it's said to avoid them at all costs. They can't physically harm you because, well, they're beacons, but they can cause extreme psychological harm. Physically, these things are just a mineral rectangle with an LED light inside and are typically red and white, but sometimes they can be other colors, and they stand at about 7 to 11 inches tall. They are sentient, but they can't verbally speak with like a physical mouth. Instead, they communicate through auditory hallucinations. They can mentally hurt someone by pulling memories or thoughts from that person's mind and repeating them louder and louder over and over again for anything near to hear. Also, an interesting fact, they're known to criticize their victims very rudely. <laughs> like, what? It's highly recommended to leave the area if a gossip beacon starts talking to you, unless you like hearing psychological torment. I don't know. So next up we have Stranglers. These are creatures who live on level 58.1 and hide in dark areas until the hunt. They're a bipedal furry creature with large beaks and their hands are like a snake that can coil around the victim's neck. That's the name, Stranglers. Their feet are similar in shape to hooves, but they're like really spongy, so they make as little noise as possible when on the hunt. They walk in a hunched over position, but are still around eight foot tall and they only hunt during the blackouts when all the lights go off on level 58.1. When they're on the hunt, they silently sulk around in the darkness to find prey, and when they find a victim, obviously they strangle it and then proceed to eat it. When the lights are turned back on, they immediately run back to the dark spot they left, and interestingly, stranglers can't stand loud noises, and it's said to make as much loud noise as you can when you're on level 58.1 so they won't come near you. To me, it sounds like I'm a strangler. I can't stand loud noises, so. So if you're in a blackout on level 58.1, make as much loud noise as you can to deter them. Okay, so I'm gonna put a warning here because the wiki says if you read about this specific entity, then you will encounter it somehow. So proceed at your own risk. I'll put a time code on screen if you wanna skip to the next creature so you don't have to hear anything about this. But if you do, final warning, here we go. So if you're still watching, the next entity is called the Numbed Man. This creature is said to know as much about you as you know about it. So if you don't know anything about it, it won't know anything about you. But since I just told you his name, he knows yours. Sorry, this guy physically is a vague humanoid shape and is actually really weak and feeble. And you can kill it easily apparently because the creature has removed all of his senses. He tore out his eyes, he mangled his nose, burst his own eardrums, and burned off all of his skin so he has no way of sensing anyone nearby, which means they can't sense him either, and this keeps him safe. This guy's crazy though. He isn't contained to any certain level of the back rooms, and has no physical barriers, so you can't just run away from him, and every noise you make draws him closer somehow. But the wiki says to, quote, Remember, he's weak, so you can defeat him with the right attack. Gee, thanks for that advice. Next is the Scrappers. These are 8 foot tall humanoids covered in hair, they have two sets of lungs, and they also have gills for underwater breathing. These creatures live in the Must Yard, which is an infinite scrapyard with old rusted cars and fences that has been flooded with almond water. The entire level is a flooded scrapyard. 
These scrappers also have huge horns and are documented to sleep most of the time, and they cannot get woken up or moved while sleeping. They only wake up on their own volition. These beasts are aggressive if provoked, and they're very fast at swimming, but slow on land. Also, their jaws can crush sheer metal and are unbreakable. Don't try to hit one in the jaw. It won't work, promise you. They live in tiny metal shelters they build, and most of the time when they're awake, they're swimming in the water. As long as you don't instigate them, you should be fine. Just try to avoid the water. Next up, we have a creature called Potri, or Potri. This is a tall, skinny creature that stands at about 6 feet 5 inches, or at about 2 meters. Potri lives on level 6 of the back rooms, and her face is covered in these pale white eyes. However, the number of eyes changes from person to person. The creature's skin is rotten, bone dry, and gray, and her arms dangle from her shoulders without any hands on them. And you can't actually see Potri with your naked eye, you could only see her in pictures. This creature is actually very dangerous due to the psychological torment she can put you through. If you keep taking pictures and Potri is in them, she will keep getting closer and closer to you until eventually being so close that your skin will start to feel insanely dry and your head will be filled with depressive thoughts. After about 7 hours of this exposure to Potri, you'll feel an unwavering urge to be not alive anymore because of those depressive thoughts and those thoughts will have completely consumed your mind and you won't be able to think about anything else. The only way to avoid this terrible end is to run away if you see poetry in a photograph you take. Next we have a creature I briefly mentioned back up when we were talking about the memory worm and it's called the splat! Exclamation mark. These things are a disgusting blob of flesh with a gelatin-like consistency and they have these eyes all over their body that constantly move and it looks like their skin is boiling constantly. Splats are located on level 0 of the back rooms, so they're not that big of a threat, but it said you still should walk slowly and confidently past them so they don't think you're an easy target. But don't move too fast, because for some reason they're attracted to fast moving objects. The way that the splats attack is by leaping onto their prey's neck and injecting some kind of poison into them. This poison causes extreme hallucinations and nausea, and these hallucinations will drive the person crazy and force them to wander deep into the back rooms where they will enter an inescapable room and die of either starvation or insanity. If you're near a splat, wrap something around your neck so they can't latch onto you and walk at a calm pace past them and you should be alright. Next up is coconut snares. These are creatures located only on level 149, which is a tropical level of the back rooms, and they are extremely dangerous rodents that live inside of coconut husks. They never really show their actual bodies because they live almost their entire life in the coconut shell, but the people who have seen them describe them as a rotund, hairless rodent. They don't really attack wanderers often, instead they just hiss and growl when you walk past, and as long as you don't provoke it, it won't attack you. However, they do have sharp teeth and jaws that crush shells and tree bark, so don't stick your hand in a coconut. And they emit a sweat from their body that slowly sticks them permanently to the inside of the shell. Ooh, that's nasty. But yeah, just don't go sticking your hands in random coconut shells and you should be fine. Up next is clinker toys. These are zombie-like humanoids that have various clock parts and apparatuses attached all over their bodies. They just walk around aimlessly until they sense a human. These creatures are docile, but most of the time, don't go near them because if you do get too close, they will attack you if they feel threatened. Clinker toys are incapable of speaking actual language. Instead, they just groan and emit a really metallic ticking sound, like a clock, but more metallic-y. And they're only on level 799 and should just be avoided to be safe. Also. Clinkers have this key sticking out of their backs, like one of those wind-up toys, so yeah, that's disturbing. Next is a really creepy one, called the Wallpaper Wraith. These are giant slugs that are located on level 13 and level 33 of the back rooms, and they stick to walls and the ceilings by using a thick red substance they emit. They're able to camouflage themselves into any color or pattern of the ceiling while they're stalking their prey. They hunt by slowly sneaking up on their prey from above, and they open their mouths and sling their tinder-like tongue around the prey's neck. Wraith's tongues are extremely strong and can break a human's neck instantly. Also, good luck fighting back with these creatures too, because if they get injured, they spray a black liquid that freezes you in your tracks, making you an easy kill. Nice. The only weakness known to the wraiths is their sensitivity to sound. 
In fact, the best and almost only way to kill them is by screaming as loud as you can when you're near. This will instantly kill them because it'll literally blow their head up. So, Also, make sure to check the ceilings ahead of you before you walk under them just to make sure you're not getting snuck up on. Duh. And last on today's episode is a creature named Red Kins. These are the only creatures located on level 196, sub-level 20 of the back rooms, and they are red beings who are supposedly immortal and only have one goal, and that is to contaminate the mind of people who don't worship them. <laughs> nice. The wiki says they're actually one of the most dangerous entities in the back rooms because of their erratic and unpredictable behavior. Creepily, there is only one outpost colony on this level, and guess what? It's named the Followers of the Red Gods. And it's populated by people who gave their lives to worshipping the Redkins. Losers. If you find yourself on level 196 of the back rooms, the Redkin will approach you from behind and it will telepathically ask you if you adore them. And if they detect that you don't, even in the slightest, the process of mental contamination begins. And this contamination is just the process of turning you into a follower and a member of the outpost I mentioned earlier. Redkins are described as a large humanoid figure covered in a giant mass of sticky red flesh, uh, given their name. They have tiny holes all over their body that always seem to be throbbing and dilating, and they ooze a black liquid out of them too. That's nasty. The only way to avoid Redkins is to constantly watch your back and to not let them sneak up behind you, because if they do, well, you're gonna get contaminated. So, yeah, that's terrifying. So first up, we have Wranglers. These are serpent-like creatures that use their huge body to distract and disorient their prey in kind of a hypnotic way. Also, I apologize for my voice. It's kind of shot right now, but we're vibing. It's alright. Wranglers appear on levels negative 6, negative 8, and negative 4.1, but can also be found in damp places on levels 2 and 14. They are classified as extremely dangerous and they should not be approached. Physically, they're massive burrowing creatures that can twist and contort in very strange ways and this helps them dig into the ground. The good news is, they're really loud when burrowing, at least when they're young. I'll talk more about that later. And they can only hear from the direction they're facing towards. So if it's facing away from you and you're making noise behind it, it can't hear you, which sucks for them, I guess. The appetite of a Wrangler is constant and they'll eat anything and everything they see. Specifically, the male ones behave that way. The female ones do not instigate things with wanderers and they normally just retreat back into their holes if anything approaches them. The only exception to this is if the female is pregnant or has kids nearby, then they'll become aggressive and hostile. And then you're screwed pretty much. Like I said earlier about the Wranglers being loud burrowers, yeah, that does not last their entire lives because when they get old, they just get the ability somehow to no clip through the floor and the walls which means they're completely silent, which is overpowered, but whatever. Their bodies physically are kind of like a translucent color, and their skin is sticky, and their eyes are a glowing white color. Male Wranglers have a human-like face with a huge teethy smile, and the females look more like a snake or a worm, as we would know. The length of a Wrangler can be anywhere from 10 to 90 miles long. I don't know about you, but to me this sounds like the worm from Spongebob, so... Next up we have Dreamweavers. This is a non-physical entity that can be discovered when you dream in the back rooms. Not creepy at all. However, the entity does not physically attack you, it observes you in your dreams. But along those same lines, the Dreamweaver can do other weird things such as altering your dream and causing you to have hallucinations while you sleep. Thankfully though, the creature does not use these psychic powers for actual bodily harm because if it did, that would be by far one of the most overpowered creatures in the back room, so let's be real. The Dreamweaver rarely appears in dreams, so it's not like every time you dream that you'll have a dream weaver appear. In fact, its appearances are really sporadic and they can't even be traced, so. However, the weaver is more likely to appear if you're interacting with a dream catcher, which is an object that causes tons of different effects to humans, including an instantaneous deep sleep, and that deep sleep attracts the dream weaver. But like I said earlier, your dreams can actually have the dream weaver even without the dream catcher. When the weaver enters your dream, it becomes unnoticeable, and it starts to manipulate your thoughts in strange ways, and it also kind of changes your perception. And after a while of experiencing this, you'll start to actually see the Dreamweaver in different areas of your dream. Weirdly, it appears to be staring at you the entire time in your dream. The creature actually feeds off of the fear of the Wanderer, so it actively 
weakens a person's mind so they become more afraid of everything. The only way to wake up from one of the Dreamweaver's hallucinations is to escape that dream through really weird means that are different between everybody. For instance, one way to escape the dream could be outrunning a wolf pack or eating a bowl of cereal. Like I said, they're different in every dream. If you do escape this creature in your dream, the effects will actually linger for weeks after you wake up. You'll often see him in your visions and thoughts and the creature will lower your need for food and water and sleep, which is bad for you because without those things, obviously you could die or become a wretch. This guy is just a menace to society though. Like... Next we have the Hermit. This is a humanoid creature of unknown origin that lives in a shack that it carries around on its own back. That's pretty cool. The shack is made of an unknown material, but it resembles tin as we know it, but it has materials that we know of that make up the rest of it, such as rotting wood and bones. Nice. When the hermit deploys this shack, a front yard type thing appears in front of it, and this yard has sticks and pikes with heads of other entities on them, such as heads of skin stealers, hounds, a large intestine of a human, interesting, and the head of a strangler, also the eyeball of a smiler, and an unknown snake entity with purple scales. Nice decorations. The actual shack itself has two rooms, a dining room and a kitchen. The dining room has six chairs around a large rectangular table, and five of those chairs are just metal folding chairs except the one chair that the hermit sits in which is a huge wooden throne with velvet cushioning, of course, because why not? For decorations, the hermit uses even more parts of entities, like the wings of a female death moth, a blue feather, and a popped balloon. However, the kitchen is more of a ragtag, jerry-rigged attempt at a normal kitchen with homemade pots and pans and ramshackle cupboards. He does have a refrigerator, though, and in the refrigerator is supposedly two gallons of almond water, two bushels of an unidentified herb, and around four pounds of various meats. That's just how I like my meats. Various. Despite the hermit's appearance, he is actually very hospitable, even though he resembles what we would call a plague doctor. He's very hospitable. He often offers wanderers lodging in a warm meal, and this meal consists of the various meat and a type of tea, which is said to be delicious actually, so... Interesting fact. His accent is a manly, slightly Irish accent, and he enjoys lengthy, deep conversations, especially deep conversations about his food and the food he likes to prepare. The hermit is known to be a cunning warrior and a skilled hunter, and has been witnessed using crossbows and bone saws and bear traps. Meg has said that the hermit never runs out of arrows for his bow, and his bone saw is always at its sharpest. He rarely hunts humans, like I said earlier, because he often welcomes them into his home, and he seems like a pretty wholesome guy, just a lone wolf who hunts for sport and offers tea to random people. I mean, how can you hate him? Unless you're one of the decapitated heads on the pikes in his yard, then you might hate him. Next up is the Game Master. This is the only entity that lives on level 389, or the gaming hall level. The Game Master controls every game on the level, which pretty much means it has full control of the entire level itself. The Game Master is actually a she, and she looks like a jester doll with a dress and sewn X-shaped eyes and she hangs in the air and kind of resembles being puppeted in a way. The master moves in weird ways and constantly does these gravity-defying mannerisms, almost to the point of where she looks like she's actually being controlled with puppet strings. And she's often found tinkering with games she makes or edits, or she's laying down like a simple ragdoll. Interestingly enough, the game master claims that she is actually trapped inside this level and she can't leave. That's creepy. I guess the cool thing though is that the game master does play these games on the level with any survivor who's trapped in level 389 but she always tries to cheat without the other player noticing, which is interesting. But if the other player does notice and calls her out, she's forced to stop playing. I guess it's just in her nature to stop playing. Nothing is known about where the creature came from, but it's assumed that an unknown entity controls her physical body movement, since her movement is so unnatural. She does seem to have telekinetic powers and reality altering abilities as well, but this only works for her games and the level's physical layout, so she can't actually use those powers on survivors, which is, Kind of nice, I guess. But yeah, she seems pretty cool. Next up is the Steel. These are mysterious creatures that take a humanoid shape, and they live on level 6 and level negative 15. They're very intelligent, but they are very private at the same time. And they stand at about 6 feet tall, with metal skin, and they have these big claw-like hands. They travel by levitating. That's cool. They still communicate to humans by telepathy and they have no visible eyes or faces or mouths or any discerning features on their face. They're not hostile to people who are lost in the back rooms and they've been documented 
actually saving people's lives and they hardly ever attack in general and they only reveal themselves to give warnings or to make deals with the traveler they don't actually reproduce by normal means instead they're all manufactured in quote the beginning area on level six or they're manufactured some places on level negative 15. another fun fact is that the steel claim to not be anywhere close to human and that they're adamant that humans play no role in their manufacturing for some reason they just keep saying that over and over again when asked they all look almost identical except some have battle scars from fighting other entities. The Steels hold members of their own species very high if they survive attacks from notable entities. The creature actually has some real life application as well, because in 1973 there was a famous encounter with aliens on the Pascagoula River, this is a real life encounter by the way, where two fishermen were apparently paralyzed and abducted by alien creatures. And then the description that the men gave of these creatures is insanely similar to those of the steel. So that's pretty cool. Even their behaviors are identical to what the men described. So if you encounter the steel, attempt to trade with it because they like trading and a trade for information because they're very wise and they like to give information to you and talk really slowly because they don't really understand fast talking, but don't lie to them because they're literally telepathic. Like that would be so dumb to lie to them. Next up is Six Arms, which is an entity located on level 0, 1, and 2 of the back rooms. This creature is attracted to stress. It would wipe out like half of our country right now. So the more stressed a traveler is, the more likely Six Arms is to pursue them. If you feel its presence, just try to calm down a little bit and it'll go away. And also, if you have sugar on you, if you put it on the ground, it will repel a six arm, so that's cool. Physically, six arms are a semi-transparent creature that's tall and it has multiple arms on it, obviously. Uh, the noise it emits is like a car engine or a chainsaw, and the tentacles that are attached to the main body of the six arms seem to be delayed in reaction time from the time the body moves. So the body will move first and then the arms will move secondly. This creature can move through walls and floors easily by no clipping and it seems to have no bounds, even though it only stays on level 0, 1, and 2. Like I said earlier, sugar repels them, but also products that are very high in sugar do too. But this will just be temporary, so you should just use this time to escape. Now, the only way to avoid this creature is to remain unstressed and to carry on just a little sugar, if at all possible. This dude is just really adamant to not eat sugar, so I respect it. Next up, we have a creature called Allures, or the Allure. This entity is located only on level 78 of the back rooms and has never been seen on any other levels. It's described as a humanoid creature that ignores all other entities, but people have witnessed entities attempting to attack it. However, they just bounce off of their aura or energy it seems. So it's like they have some kind of invisible force field around them at all times. They just wander aimlessly through level 41 and they play an unrecognizable song on their saxophone that they always carry with them. Now this part's creepy. Every wanderer that hears this music is instantly entranced by it. Kind of like a siren singing to a pirate. The wanderer will then follow the allure for 15 to 20 minutes and then the wanderer will randomly fall into the ground through the floor to never be seen again. Nice. Something weird is that if an allure encounters a wanderer who has a saxophone, it'll stop playing its own saxophone and it'll wait for the wanderer to play a little song. After they're done, the allure will repeat the exact same song but with extra flair on it. When the allure is in this state, they're considered harmless, but any other time, they're very dangerous. Physically, an allure looks like a mannequin with a deep black skin color in a black suit holding a saxophone, like I said earlier. And like I said, it also has an invisible force field around it. Even though it looks like a mannequin, it moves very swiftly and smoothly like a human. The only way to keep you safe from longing to walk towards this music on level 78 is to wear earplugs at all times so you don't hear it. That's creepy. This one's really eerie. I don't know why. Next up is something called a clicker or the clickers. These are little typewriter things that run around on wheels. Like that's the entire physical description. They're just typewriters on wheels. No one has ever been able to find out what brand the typewriter is because these things weigh so much so you can't pick them up, which is interesting. They wander aimlessly on wheels, like I said, around levels 13, 21, and 45, and nothing gets in their way to stop them, actually. Not even hostile entities. They ignore everything around them, and other entities ignore them as well. Like I just said, hostile entities have been observed leaving the clickers alone, so they have the respect of the hostile ones. Pretty cool. Keys on the click are in a QWERTY arrangement, but if you attempt to type on one, the letters will be a pictographic language, kind of like hieroglyphics, so you won't be able to understand them. If you find a clicker, feel free to take some of the paper for yourself off its back, just don't try to pick one up or get in its way because then you'll be knocked down. Also, it's said not to stand by a clicker for too long since the clicking sound can draw enemy entities to you. 
So next up is a creature called Leon. This is a singular entity that is pretty much a toddler sized leech with an eccentric fashion sense. Like I said, he's about three feet tall and he's been described as a quote, wandering salesman. And he talks to humans in perfect English. And the salesman part comes from when he talks to you, he often tries to sell you a variety of items in exchange for your blood. Now these items can range from junk to highly sought after items like royal rations. Like I said earlier, Leon is an upright three feet tall leech. He has skinny noodle arms that stick out of his sides. And on the front of his body, he has a ring shaped mouth with three large teeth in it. These teeth are so big that he has a slight lisp when he talks. He wears a white collar and a multicolored tie as well. Also, he wears tuxedo cuffs on his little noodle arms, and most times he's seen with a four foot tall brown top hat. And Leon always has his leather briefcase on him that can fit objects much larger than him in it. This is where he keeps his merchandise he wants to sell you. No matter what weather you find Leon in, his skin is constantly soaking wet and he leaves a trail wherever he goes. Leon is very friendly with wanderers. When he is encountered, he'll strike up a conversation and will even follow a wanderer on their travel or duty. He'll continue to follow the wanderer until he sells them an item or is shoot off. If you do make a sale with Leon, he will then remove his big hat and he will puff out purple dust that comes from the top of his head and this will knock you out in about 20 seconds. When the buyer is unconscious, Leon will bite their shoulder and consume the amount of blood that is owed, since you paid for whatever you wanted to buy in blood. It's believed by most that this gas he emits is a form of anesthesia and not an attack, and he does this so you won't feel him, you know, biting your shoulder and sucking your blood out. When Leon is done, he'll leave the area, and the wanderer will wake up about 10 minutes later with a scar on their shoulder and the item they bought on the ground nearby. Nice. I don't think I trust that, but who knows? Maybe Leon is a nice guy. Next up, we have dentists. These are pretty nasty, I gotta warn you, so I'm not gonna show any nasty pictures, just describe them. These are humanoid entities that look like a melted person, and they're made out of human teeth, gum tissues, and jaws taken from their victims. These are very, very hostile creatures, that begin to slowly saunter towards the wanderer the second they hear one. If the dentist does catch you, it'll tackle you and it'll take all of your teeth and gums and stick them to itself. That's nasty. Dentists from afar look lazy and slow, but they get this huge burst of energy and strength when they're on the hunt. But you can hear a dentist by its nasty squishing and squelching sounds it makes when it moves, or by the disgusting smell of the rotting flesh that it emits from itself. The good news about this entity is that they're blind, they have no eyes, and they can't see, but they do have really good hearing to counteract that, but I don't care. I'm just glad they can't see me, because that would be so nasty if they had big eyes on them or something. But yeah, this dude's terrifying. And last up for today's video is an entity called the Photoshops, or Photoshops. These things live wherever there are computers in the back rooms, so in offices. They appear to be blocks stacked on top of each other, and they're very dangerous. Its abilities are really unusual because at a quick glance, it looks just like a stack of boxes or blocks or kind of like a statue. But if you get within five feet of it, a large clear box with black edges will surround you. Any matter that tries to pass through these invisible walls will be destroyed, almost as if the Photoshop is cropping you out of existence. However, the entity does not attack you if you take pictures of it with a camera. Even if you get really close, it won't attack you if you're taking pictures. People think this is because it likes getting attention and praise which is really funny to me. If you put an object in front of the Photoshop, a bloody hand will come out of it and reach it back in and you will see it displayed on the computer screen nearby. That's weird. Photoshops have two random pictures of eyes for eyes, a picture of a pit bull's mouth for a mouth, and pictures of flesh for all sides of its body and the entire entity looks like it's constantly glitching in and out of reality. And they're approximately seven to nine feet tall. Totally not terrifying at all or anything. So first up for the video, I want to talk about an enigmatic entity called the Red Knight, which I believe is the first enigmatic entity that I'm going over on the channel, maybe? This entity can be seen all over the back rooms, and I'll explain what that means in a second. The Red Knight has been seen by a lot of people and is actually pretty legendary in the lore and stories about the back rooms. Now the entity looks like a knight and is wearing armor that looks like it's from somewhere around the 16th century. He has a big broadsword that he wears on his shoulder and a shield that he carries in his other hand. He also has a cape, which is always cool, and it's a red cape with gold trim. 
His armor and weaponry are in good condition for the most part, but some of the pieces have dents in them, especially on his chest plate, and his cape is a tad bit torn on the very end. Other than that, he's vibing. The Red Knight is known far and wide throughout the backrooms as a famed entity slayer with inhuman strength, speed, and agility. And it's said that he can cut any monster in half with one single swipe from his sword. Pretty Sigma, if you ask me. But the good news is for us normal people, the Red Knight, quote, doesn't try to eat your face the moment he sees you. And he always somehow appears to people when they first noclip into the back rooms and run into their first really dangerous situation. But he really tends to only do this to people who are fairly new. So if you've been in the back rooms for a couple years, he's probably not going to help you unless you really, really need it. The knight barely talks to people, but when he does, it's mainly right after he just saved them and he's instructing them on what to do or how to get to the next safe space where there's humans. After he explains this stuff to you, he will then grab out his sword and cut open the space-time continuum itself just in the air and it will form a portal to a level that's safe. Could it be any cooler? Like a knight opening a portal with a sword. Wow. The Red Knight is listed as a superhuman in its description because of how strong he is, and he's been seen fighting creatures way bigger or way more powerful, or he's been outnumbered, and he still wins. He can get injured though because he's been seen limping away from fights with broken bones, but he's never actually lost a fight with anything, so he might be invincible. We don't know. Either way, a red knight with a cape and a magic sword that can open portals, must I say anything else? And the fact that he tries to help as many people as he possibly can makes it even better. Next up is an entity called King Rasputin Bartholomew III. Yes, that is his name, and yes, he looks like that. Rasputin is listed as Entity 84 and looks like a huge chow chow dog that's really hairy and wanderers over a ton of different levels have claimed to see him. Now this entity isn't just your normal dog because his fur has a bunch of weird anomalies that happen with it and it's not just normal dog fur. Specifically weird things happen if you touch it. For example, one person touched his fur and fell into level 241 through the ceiling. So, the dog has a red collar that somehow doesn't noclip into it like every other object does that touches it. Instead, it just stays there and it has on the front his name, Rasputin Bartholomew III. And then on the other side, it says, quote, If lost, return to the seventh dialect of the March of the Atrodium, the Killer of Jungum. Which, no one knows what that means or why it's there. It's weird. I don't know why it'd be on a collar, but it's there. The good news is... That he's friendly and he acts very similarly to dogs from real life he'll follow you around if he wants to and he seems impervious to other entities because none of them even try to attack him in fact they all run away and there's even been a meg report that he's barked and growled to scare away some entities thereby saving a person that he had bonded with so if you form a bond with him then he'll protect you it's presumed that entities are just afraid to attack him for some reason because he's not that big but they all run away his biology is interesting because like i said he's a breed called chow chow and apparently he's around four years old but his hair is the weirdest thing about him because Meg cut off five inches of it and it all grew back within an hour. He also doesn't eat food or drink water on his own, but he'll eat something if you give it to him. And if you pet him, you'll see that the fur doesn't actually connect to a body. Like you won't be able to feel a solid body. It just feels like floating fur. And if you reach a few feet into the fur, then you'll be sucked into and dropped into level 241. So King Rasputin Bartholomew III is an invincible dog with magic fur that can teleport you to level 241 just by petting him. And he's protective over people that are nice to him. Pretty cool. Now the last friendly entity for this video is the musician entity, or entity 137. This thing mainly lives on level 114, but has been seen on a bunch of other levels 
as well. It looks like a tall, skinny creature that is wearing a pinstripe suit and a big top hat, and you'll know he's close to you when you hear music playing, and this music actually has some cool properties. Like if he walks through a dangerous area with dangerous entities, the music itself will make those entities passive when they're in his presence. He also has the ability to no-clip anywhere he wants to, and can go to any level at all. And as far as his behavior, He's actually friendly, and he's very helpful to wanderers that he meets, and he offers almond water to everyone he meets, so it's pretty wholesome. He's very good at social skills, and he likes to talk and walk with wanderers, and he likes to converse about anything, but especially music. Except for some reason, he hates Entity 138, so like, don't bring that up, no one knows why. He's also aware that how he looks might scare some wanderers, so if he notices that it scares someone, he apologizes and walks away. If for some reason he gets attacked, then that music that he emits from earlier will go from being quiet to extremely loud and will burst the eardrums of anything nearby. And if he doesn't do that attack, then apparently both of his hands will transform into massive claw hooks to attack his enemy in a more physical way. Also, if he makes a mess of an entity that he attacks, he openly complains about ruining his suit, which I find hilarious, by the way. He's anywhere from 6'5 to 6'10, and is really skinny, and he's seemingly impervious to any fatal attack from entities. That's pretty neat. The entity in question is called Entity 666, aka the Happy Files Virus. Its IETS rating is 4C, which means the entity is very likely to unalive or wound you very badly if you don't take the proper precautions. And that this entity possesses low level human intelligence, but is still extremely dangerous. The entity itself is like a computer virus that's been causing chaos across the internet inside of the back rooms. And not just the internet, on the computers, and it's even a real life threat as well. And you'll see why I say that in a second. Meg has tried to send other web crawling antivirus programs to destroy this Happy Files virus, but it's been deemed impossible to destroy because of how fast it clones itself. Entity 666 is very dangerous.exe file, and it also is a real manifestation that can describe itself in video game form, in executable form, in utility program forms, or even in real life form. As some of you know, there are computers on loads of different levels inside of the backrooms, which makes this threat even more dangerous because it reaches almost every level. The websites that Entity666 has been targeting are fileshare.backrooms, iirc.backrooms, folders.meg, and backroomsdrive.meg. And this entity will code itself into the files on those websites that can be downloaded and it will infect those files and when you download them, well you just downloaded the entity. It will specifically disguise itself into a .zip file so when you download it from the website, even though you thought you downloaded a game or something, it will actually be this entity. Once you extract that .zip file, you'll see a text document that says, thank you for downloading this program, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for using Happy Files. And the program you're wanting to download will be there too, kind of. But instead of it being a normal high definition icon, it'll be a lower quality grainy picture instead of a normal one. If the program you wanted to download was like a utility program or something, like Microsoft Word, then the icon will be a picture of the entity's face instead of the normal image. As soon as you open the program, You'll notice that the Windows icon in the bottom left of your screen will also change into the entity's face. There's no way to change it back, you can't close the program with Task Manager, you can't delete it, it's just completely infected, and you're probably doomed. I'm gonna be real with you, you're probably doomed. Once you launch this program, you are now considered Entity 66A because Entity 666 will now start hunting you down. If the program you downloaded was supposed to be a video game, then at around 15 minutes after you launch the game, you'll be able to see the manifestation of this entity inside of the actual gameplay. It'll start to follow your in-game character around slowly, but then it'll start to run really, really fast towards your character, and once it catches up to you, it'll jump scare on the screen by flashing a picture of its face, 
and it'll crash your computer, turn off the lights, make the electricity go out in your room, and everything will just be black. Then it's time for the physical manifestation of the entity. It's been described as a tall, all-black humanoid, measuring around 2.1 meters in height. It wears a white mask and it has extremely unsettling wide eyes with a huge smile. Now its facial expression does not change through its manifestation at all. It's the same on the computer, it's the same in real life, and it's always creepy. After this entity has had its fun as a virus on your computer, it will then morph into a real life flesh and blood creature and will try to jump scare you until you have a heart attack in real life. If that doesn't work, then it'll chase you like in the video game. Slowly at first, but then extremely fast to the point where it's running around you in circles, and then it'll attack you in a gory way. After it successfully offs the person it chooses, the downloaded file that it came in and all the evidence of the entity will delete itself of any evidence from the computer. And it's like it never existed. So to summarize, this insane new entity is pretty much a virus that clings to a real program that people would download with the backroom's internet. It'll infect whatever program that is. Once you launch it, it'll manifest into a real flesh and blood entity in the same room as you and chase you down until it offs you. That's actually terrifying, bro. Like, imagine the reach of this thing. It could reach the entirety of the backrooms if it wanted to. Facelings are humanoid creatures that look just like a normal human, except that their face is smooth and has no features, no nose, no eyes, no discernible features. It's said that they dress in very mundane, boring clothes, and they're considered not to be a threat. They're not very aggressive. In their free time, they just wander around aimlessly, and people say that there are adult and child facelings, and that the children are way more mischievous and, and like to do pranks and stuff like that. Facelings are often hunted by more dangerous creatures because of their passive demeanor. It makes them easy prey. Second, we have a creature called Hound or Hounds. Now, these are not dogs, but instead they're humanoids with a thick shaggy hair on their heads that runs down their back and a massive mouth full of sharp teeth. They tend to look ungainly and have really long and skinny limbs with razor sharp claws at the end. And the reason they're called hounds is because they crawl around on all fours, even though they look like a human body. These are the most common hostile creatures and are said to be only found on the upper levels of the back rooms. And supposedly they aren't smart, so you can easily avoid them and outmaneuver them, or you can even scare them if you puff yourself up and act intimidating. Third, we have a weird one uh, called clumps. So these are pretty much a three foot tall cluster ball of arms and legs just clumped together, thus the name. They're pretty hostile and seem to always be hungry and ready for a chase. Every clump has one longer limb than the other ones that it reaches out to grab its prey with. And once it starts pulling the prey in, it opens its mouth to reveal its razor sharp teeth. At that point, I think you're screwed. So fourth, we have these things called dullers. These are humanoid in shape, but they're missing prominent features like ears, noses, and a face. They've got gray skin, and they're really awkward on their feet, but they're said to have extreme speed, and dullers supposedly run away from anything except when they're on the hunt. They've got this really cool attack where they wait at the end of a hallway for their prey to start walking up that hall, and they'll throw their arm and hand in the wall next to them, and it'll no-clip and come out of the wall right by where the prey is walking and it'll grab them and then pull it to them. That is one of the coolest attacks I've ever heard of. And dullers are said not to like almond water. I don't know why I mentioned that, but it seems to be a relevant detail. Fifth, we have death moths. They're giant human sized moths with pale yellow grayish faces. It's said that male death moths are supposedly harmless and you can even tame them, but the female ones are typically larger and more aggressive, and female ones actually spray acid from their mouth to stun their prey, so that's cool. And just like moths in real life, death moths are attracted to lights, so if one's hunting you, just go away from any light source and they won't attack. So sixth we have these things called windows, or the window. And these creatures are in the shape of a window pane with a shadowy figure behind it sometimes. These are said to just appear on level 1 and 2, and they'll only attack if their prey is unaware of its presence. It lures victims to it by whispering something that intrigues the prey, kind of like skinwalkers do, and when it gets close, it will suck you in and devour its meal. Sometimes the windows aren't humanoid shadows behind them, sometimes they're a painting or a picture, but either way, it's basic knowledge to avoid windows at all costs because they're considered extremely dangerous. 
So, 7th is Neanderthals. They're pretty basic. They're just Neanderthals, like you probably heard about. In the back rooms, they are said to wield stone tools, and they're usually in groups of 4 to 17, and they're pretty passive, and they're known to actually be pretty smart about the back rooms, and pretty wise. That's pretty much it, just cavemen running around in the back rooms. So, 8th, we have Howlers. So no one's ever seen a full howler, so there's no prominent physical description given. All that's heard from them is their howl, thus the name. Other entities tend to run off when they hear the howl, so some people think that the howlers have the ability to make themselves invisible or blend in with their environment somehow, like a chameleon or an octopus. So ninth, we have a pretty cool one. They're called Skin Stealers. Now, these are big humanoids who have pale yellow-gray skin with deep-set white eyes, and they wear the skin of their victims as a disguise. They eat human flesh, but only when they're hungry, and they wear the skin of their victims by attaching the skin to these bumps on themselves that are like those octopus suckers, and that will pull the skin tightly to them to make it look like they're actually humans. When they're not doing that, they just wander around aimlessly. It's said that they can mimic human voices, but they can't understand languages, so it's not perfect. And they just repeat phrases that they've heard before. So 10th, we have a really strange one. And I don't know how to pronounce it, but it'll be on screen. And it looks like Octayogreg. Uh, no one knows what these creatures look like, but there are two known kinds. The first kind mimics the voice of a loved one or a friend, and the second version is believed to be a humanoid shape, without any features except two pupils on their face. These creatures are very dangerous, and they hum classical music, and if you hear that, you're supposed to run as fast as you can for as long as you can until you literally drop and fall asleep, because you can't run anymore. And that's actually how you get out of the back rooms. If this happens to you, and you escape the back rooms, you are never supposed to go back. Because if they do manage to catch you, they'll either drive you insane by playing this classical music constantly around you, or they'll just kill you quickly if you're lucky. Falling asleep after encountering this creature is one of the only ways to escape the backrooms that's known. Eleventh is a creature called the Lighter. These are evidently non-living organisms, and if you look at one for too long, you'll go temporarily blind. And if you get too close, it'll start burning you, and if the Lighter does touch you, you're instantly vaporized. So, don't do that. Twelfth is the disease. It was named that by an unnamed explorer who said that it's a virus transmitted by the black mold that grows in the corners of the back rooms and the hallways. Some symptoms are eye irritation, itchy rash, fever, internal bleeding. Supposedly if you contract this disease, you will lose your sanity and then die two days later. So that's fun. So, 13th, we have transporters, or as sometimes they're called, grabbers. These are tall, dark humanoids, and they only appear when you meet a T-junction in a hallway. Two of the three paths will be normal paths, but if you go into the wrong one, you'll be met with the transporter at the end of the hallway, and if you turn around, you'll see where you just walked through the entrance is now a wall. Once this happens, the creature will run towards you, grab you, and either kill you or transport you to a different level of the back rooms and no one really knows where that is. Fourteenth, we have Yosters or Yosters. These are large, fat, flabby creatures that look like a mix between a lizard and a platypus. Their moods can vary from aggressive to docile depending on their age, and they're only found in the first five levels. They survive by slurping the moisture out of the carpets in the back rooms, Ugh. but the good news is they their meat is edible, although it supposedly tastes bad and burnt no matter how you cook it. Fifteenth, we have the chickens. These are just massive chickens with a beak full of tiny teeth. They're fast and aggressive and can deliver venom through their bites. And their only weakness is sharp turns. So evidently, if you want to run from one, just take a bunch of sharp turns and you should be good. Sixteenth is a pretty easy one. It's death sheep. These creatures look like sheep, but have glowing eyes and are known to somehow change people from people into sheep. Seventeenth is the king. And this entity can destroy walls and no clip at will and it's very hard to fight against because it's said to have an unbreakable set of armor. There's not much known about the king other than what I just said, so. 18th, we have Jerry or Jerry's. So a Jerry is a small bird that can control the mind of the person that's holding it. People who fall victim to Jerry's are never seen again and no one knows where they go. So if you see a bird that you think is a Jerry, run away as fast as you can. 19th is Dithels. These are creatures that look like large lampreys or hagfishes and according to many people, dithels were originally fish that were swimming in the real ocean, but then no-clipped into the back rooms, and then they were somehow changed into this dithel entity. 
So 20 is a pretty easy one. It is just death ostriches. That's exactly what it sounds like. And they attack you with their beak and will slash you with their taloned legs. 21 is a disease called a volatile. So this is an infection that will turn people into these zombie-like creatures. They're extremely hostile and will attack anything that it sees and it will attempt to infect any nearby human that it can possibly get to. They live in these hives and they communicate by clicking their jaws together. 22 is Puff Pals. These are spherical creatures that have stubby limbs and no fingers and they also have oval shaped eyes and a dot for a mouth and they're said to kind of look like Kirby. They're very docile creatures and passive and they don't speak any languages so they're kind of useless. 23rd we have the Cat which is a neutral creature that travels between levels. It has human intelligence and it speaks English as well as Aramaic. So yeah, we have a sentinel cat. Nice. So 28th is a Silbol, I believe is how it's pronounced. These are pale humanoids that are very territorial. They also hunt in packs, but they aren't known to leave their area unless they're disturbed. They can't talk, but they're able to work together in a pack formation somehow, and it's not known how they communicate. It's said that if you encounter one, you can just slowly back away and they will leave you alone. So now we are on to part two. These are the confirmed level exclusive creatures that are known to just be on one level or a certain number of levels and nowhere else in the back rooms. So number 25 is the resi fly, which looks just like resin frozen onto a fly. It's said that the fly has a dripping texture. It looks like it's wet and it's dripping resin off the sides. And it's said to be extremely friendly. These only reside on level 123,452. 26th, we have Antivas. These are large ant-like beings, but are far more intelligent and aggressive than their real life counterparts. They'll attack anything they see and they are located on the same level as the resi fly. 27th is the Conductor. This is a recently discovered entity and it's said to be a male humanoid that looks like a child but is wearing a navy blue Conductor's outfit. The creature is supposedly very intelligent and likes to answer questions. However, it will not answer any questions referring to the back rooms. If you ask the Conductor if you can leave the back rooms, he will just say, sorry, but that's just not possible. 28th is a creature called the Break Room Man. This entity only lives on level 4 and is a white humanoid that is 7 feet tall and he's very friendly. He sits in a big brown chair and has large dark eyes and supposedly helps guide people to settlements. 29th is the Eyes of the Dark. This entity appears only on level 647 and has red glowing eyes and massive hands that are said to be 15 feet long. That's all we know about the creature because no one has seen a body, just its red glowing eyes and massive hands and no one knows what happens to its prey when it grabs it. 30th is Blast Bots. These are indigo in color and they resemble robots that we know. They are always holding laser guns and are very strict and hostile if not listened to. And they're only on level negative 257. It's said that if you look at a Blast Bot for too long, then you'll just melt into a clump of flesh. 31st, we have Auditorians, which are beings made entirely out of sound. They're also attracted to sound, so the more noise you make, the closer they'll come to you. When they get near you, the air around you will feel thick and you'll start shaking and you will not be able to breathe and your eardrums are probably going to burst. Auditorians are found on level 2000. 32nd, we have employees. These are the only creatures on level 40 of the back rooms and they appear as a gray-skinned teenage boy with long emo hair. They have no eyes or eyelids, just sunken indentions where eyes should be. They have no mouth as well, and they wear plain white shirts with their names on name tags. Now you have to call them by their name for them to remain passive. If you don't, they will become aggressive and attack you. 33rd is Dancers. These are docile beings that exist in the mirror on level 735. They appear in the reflection in groups of 8 to 10, and they make no noise other than very soft taps as they step and dance. If you join them in dancing, they will respect you and allow you to pass through the mirror to a safer level. 34th is Screamers, which are very, very tall humanoids that walk in an awkward, jagged way. They only have a massive mouth instead of a face, and they dart back and forth very quickly. In fact, it's said that you can't even see them when they're moving. The only thing you can hear is their gut-wrenching scream while they run. While they don't attack humans, their screaming is not good for your sanity, and they are only found on level negative 2. 35th is the Beast of level 5. This is something only mentioned by people who have been trapped and have lost all sanity on level 5, but everyone who's seen it has given a similar description. The basic consensus is that it's a tall, scaly humanoid that wears a suit, and it has the head of a squid with tentacles coming out of its mouth. It's said to not physically attack, but it will mentally torment you. 
36 is a weird one, as if these other ones aren't weird. It's the thing on level 7. There is very little information about this creature, but it's believed to be highly intelligent and has the ability to write, even though it can't speak. It's supposedly omnivorous, brutal, and it doesn't like humans. Its physical description is kind of crazy, because it's said to be 11,000 meters long, with no features except that it's snake-like. It's also said to be able to swallow a hotel whole, and it's the only creature on level 7 of the back rooms. Also, it has regenerative properties, making it invincible. So, that's nice. 37th is Anithicas which are a group of creatures found only on level 3. They're about 9 foot tall and are described as a walking humanoid shadow. They run at you with insane speed, and if they see you, they will chase you until they capture you, and they will cause you to lose all the sanity you have. Their necks are crooked, and their heads are said to hang from their body and swing when they run, and the only way to run them off is by chanting the Heart Sutra, which is a Buddhist chant about the void, and since the Anithikas came from the void, they run away when they hear it. 38th is a creature named Lucy. She is a docile and helpful humanoid creature found on level 1 of the back rooms. She has long black hair, however every photo of her will not process or it will disappear when it's taken. Her bedroom, which is where she is, is located behind a fake wall that you can no-clip through on level 1, and from there she will help you through another false wall that will lead to an exit. Some posit that Lucy was a very early traveler to the back rooms and got trapped on level 1 and she lost all of her sanity. This is corroborated by her notebook saying that, quote, I don't know how long I can go on. I found a way back to that old maze, but I don't think I'll be able to make it out in one piece. 39th are the formless, which are pretty much formless humanoids who appear to be melting, and they leave a liquid trail that has a consistency of paint. They're extremely hostile, and they only appear in 1913 sub-level 1913.1, and a person can be transformed into a formless if one absorbs them. 40th are the Hunters, who are a group of humanoids with a weird German-American accent, which means you can't communicate with them, and they appear to be completely normal humans besides their faces are torn off. They carry weapons ranging from guns to machetes to axes and are located only on level 933. So 41st, we've got a really weird one, and I'm actually going to make a solo video just dedicated to this entity. Uh, they are called Entity 1143, the Infected. These entities are a species of humanoid zombies that are drenched in a thick, dark, purple liquid. When they smile, they expose their sharp, magenta teeth, and their eyes glow purple as well. Males have X-shaped eyes, and females have heart-shaped eyes. They are located on level 1008 and are very hostile. They live and destroy buildings on that level, and that's all I'm going to talk about for now, because like I said, I'm going to make a full video about Entity 1143s. The 42nd and the last part of part 2 are Entity 1345s, the bots. These are these weird plastic figures that do not appear to have a nervous system, organs, blood, or bones, and they appear to have no consciousness at all and they don't respond to things that are in front of them. However, if they are touched, they will not stop until they kill whoever has touched them. And they can be any shape ranging from a horse, to a crocodile, to an owl, to a lizard, and they are only found on level 1009. And finally, number one is a creature that I have not covered on my channel before, which is surprising, and it's called a Phobic Centipede, or Entity 134. Their best physical description is that they look like a shadowy outline of a centipede, a giant one at that too, they're huge. They live in the darkest spots on seemingly random levels, and they can communicate intelligently with anyone, in any language. Every attempted picture of the creature has extreme glitching and distortion on it, which makes it pretty impossible to get a good look at it. These creatures are very, very hostile, and they wait for wanderers to pass near them, and when someone does, they project a picture of a loved one from that person's life onto their own body, kinda like a TV projection. They do this to try to lure the wanderer into the shadows, and it works out all the time, because how surprised would you be if you saw a picture of someone you loved and you were stuck in the back rooms? I mean, you'd probably walk towards it. When a person does walk into the shadows, the centipede will use human arms, it has two human arms, and it will use that to pull you further in, and this is the point where the psychological torment will start. This thing will literally induce sleep paralysis and make you go through your worst nightmare. It tells you things like you're never going to escape and it even makes you see your biggest fears. And the whole time it's doing this, it's quietly laughing and giggling. Nice. Bro, if a giant centipede grabs me, makes me not be able to move, and then puts a gigantic spider in my dream, I'm, I'm just giving up at that point. But even after this, this stupid creature is not done yet. 
It sometimes will let you get up and run away just to chase you like some sick game. Yeah, okay. The centipede has this black fog that floats around it too and it has knife-like fingers and claws, so it can just elacerate you if it wants to. It's also got around 12,000 small centipede legs and two huge human arms. The head on the centipede can either be a normal centipede head or it can be a female's head. And the head is always smiling, which is weird. It also has pale white eyes. But the creature can actually change its own head to look like anyone from your life too, which makes it even more real. Nice. They could literally just change their head into the head of your mom and you would walk towards them. I mean, why wouldn't you? These things are sadistic for no reason. Also, I want to point out the first encounter with one was when Meg workers saw one crawl out of a grave saying, quote, come here, sweetheart, grandma misses you. Then the workers saw a wanderer run towards the creature because they thought it was their grandma, and then it proceeded to eat that person whole. Nice.